We're going to go through salvation history, 45 minutes through the entire Bible. Do you think we can do it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not thoroughly. Not thoroughly. So we're going to do um, a helicopter view. Uh, we're not going to. We're not going to drive. We're not going to drive through the Bible. We're going to do a helicopter over the Bible. Um, and so today I'm using this. Um, this Bible is a Great Adventure Bible. It's a really beautiful resource. Uh, by, put out by Ascension Press that really helps to see the big picture of salvation history um, and helps you to see the different time periods and kind of see the whole story in the big picture of the Bible. And so I'm going to be using a lot of the kind of um, color schemes and names for the time periods and all of that from uh, Jeff Cavins, who was one of the authors of this Bible as far as like the the time periods and the coloring of it. It's a Catholic translation. Um, So anyway, that's where I'm getting a lot of my resources. I didn't make all this stuff up. I'm not that smart. But uh, I hope that it's helpful to you. And if you want to learn more, there's a lot more um, that he has. Um, So let's let's get started. So this the salvation history. um, We start start with the early world. The early world is that time period that we all have heard of at the very least. Adam and Eve creation, Genesis 1 through 12. Um, So we have here um, the uh, the first, our first parents. We have Adam and Eve who, um, you know, the, the story is told, it's real events that are told with symbolic names and places. So whether or not Adam and Eve existed as Adam and Eve, we don't know. But what we do know and what we do believe is that our first parents transgressed, sinned against God, and that we were changed for the worse because of it. And so God created everything that is out of love. He freely created it. He didn't have to create us. But because he loved us so much, he created us out of love. And he created us in a state of original justice and holiness, a very technical term. We were created very good. And we still are very good. We still have that dignity that he bestowed upon us at the beginning. But because of us falling to temptation and sinning, then we lost that original state of justice and holiness. And now we have a tendency to sin. Whereas before... Before that fall, before the original sin, which we all inherit, our parents did not have that. Um, And so sin and death and all kinds of disorder come into the world because of that original sin. And so that is the basics of that beginning, is is, um, a, a, a true story insofar as it goes, but the names and the details are given for deeper effect. So the next step in our journey is going to be Genesis 9. We've all, we, we, hear, we see the proliferation of sin continuing in between now and this point where their children, Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, kill, Cain kills Abel out of jealousy. And so we see that God created us good and then this, this sin that affected us at the beginning is starting to just get out of control a little bit, that we're starting to kill our own family members. And so there's a problem and at the very end, we're going to see the definitive answer that God gives to the problem. But the problem is sin, and our greatest sickness is sin. And we're going to see that throughout the whole Old Testament. Um, so because of the wickedness in the world, and because of the sin that had proliferated to such a degree that it was beyond help, um, God sent the flood in order to recreate the earth. So the story of Noah and the ark is actually uh, very much intentionally written as a recreation story. I mean, you hear the same words like be fruitful and multiply. You hear all these different words in Genesis 9 to, for God to renew what had gone wrong because of our sin, because of our fault. And so we, Noah and his family repopulate the earth. His sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, are the ones that will continue on. Um, Ham is bad. He sins against his father. The way to remember that, deviled Ham. You have deviled Ham. Devil is bad. 
I didn't make that up, it's Scott Hahn, but I think it's really well done. So if you ever want to remember who's the bad son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then Shem uh, is the good one. And that's where the line of all of the good, um, good people throughout the Bible seem to flow from that line of Shem, which I think means name, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, Hebrew. So, um, so we have this one holy couple in Adam and Eve. God blesses them. He, he gives them that garden. He gives them everything that they need. And what do they do? They choose the only thing that they're told not to do. So then sin comes in the world. And then we have one holy family. So this, this relationship that God is forming with us, this God who loves us so much, is starting to expand to more than just this couple, but now it's a family. And so throughout the Bible, we're going to see how God wants to extend his love to the entire human race, to everyone that exists. But he has to choose a specific people at first so that they can be a light to the nations, so that more people can know who this God actually is. And it's kind of an interesting question. Why does God choose us? But he does. So next we have, as I have here, um, the next time period is the time period of the patriarchs. So we're getting into now very concrete historical events that um, Abraham is our, is our marker. And so God chooses Abraham around, these, these years are rough estimates, but around the year 2000 BC is when God calls Abraham. And um, so then we have this call of this man who's in his 70s at the time, super old, and he is all of his life established, everything. He's getting to be 90 when he gets to be, when he gets to be, I was referring more to the 90, because he, he's going to be, but the point I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is not that anybody's super old, is not that anybody's super old, I apologize, I'm not very prudent all the time. What I mean by that is, what I mean by that is, imagine, imagine whatever stage of life you're at, picking everything up, picking everything up, and going a thousand, thousand miles and moving after everything is already established in your life. After everything is already set, everything is set, and God says, I'm going to choose you, Abraham. I'm choosing you, and I'm going to bless the world through you. I'm going to bless you with a, a great name. I'm going to bless you with many descendants, and I'm going to bless you with land. So this threefold covenant that God offers to Abraham. And so, so somebody say something, sorry. Um, I didn't know if there was a question, but what's that? Okay, sorry. So Abraham has this threefold covenant that God chooses him to, he says, take your, take your family, take everything, and tr go to this land that I tell you to go to, and there I will bless you, I will give you what you need. And so many, many years pass by, and still no land, or still no descendants. What's going on, God? I never had any descendants, and I still don't have any descendants. Are you not going to be faithful? Are you not going to keep your promise? Um, so God reaffirms this covenant that he made with him. So a covenant is um, an exchange of persons. I give myself totally to you, and you will give yourself totally to me. The best analogy or the best image of covenant that I think most can relate to is a marriage, that the husband and the wife decide, I'm giving myself totally to you, period, full stop, for life. That's what God does for us. He says, I give myself totally to you, period, full stop, forever. I will be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. And God shows Abraham, I will be faithful to you by making this covenant very concrete. And he says, get me a heifer and all these different animals. And we're going to, and, and I'm, they're going to, he sacrifices them. And then he has Abraham walk through the pieces of these animals. And that's to signify that if I violate this covenant, you, this will happen to me. Just like these animals were split in half, this will happen to me. So this is an old form of making covenants, of saying, I give myself totally to you. So God is speaking in a language that Abraham knows. So you'll notice this color here is red, it's crimson. 
um, and the time period before was, was blue. Um, the Earth is meant to be the Earth from space, the color of the Earth from space for creation. And this crimson is meant to be, um, I believe, the blood of the covenant that, that Abraham makes. A very powerful story from this uh, story in Genesis is the uh, sacrifice of Isaac. So God finally gives him his son uh, after a lot of things in between there. And then um, Isaac grows up and God says, take your son Isaac and go to this mountain. And so they go and they're going to uh, offer sacrifice to God. But Abraham knows that God is asking him to sacrifice his son. And he's like, imagine that. You, you made me move when I was not so old, but now I'm a little older. And I moved all the way over here. And now I'm 90 something. And I get here. And now you're going to have me sacrifice my son, who I waited 90, 90 something years to have. And so then he gets to the mountain. And Abraham's, I can't imagine what was going on in his heart and mind. But God's testing his faith um, to, to see what he will do. And so there's, he's carrying wood up to the mountain, and uh, Isaac is. And so he's not, he's, I think there's a lot of times um, depicted as a young boy who's, who's kind of resisting this, uh, this, this sacrifice by his father. Um, I think the evidence, I've seen evidence of uh, that he was actually older because um, he was able to carry this much weight on his shoulders up a mountain. And he, he wasn't, there's no evidence that he resisted this sacrifice. So God, so Abraham, ready, ready to sacrifice his son to give it all up. And then the angel stops him and says, do not sacrifice your son. Do not touch him. And so God's teaching them child sacrifice is a no-no. Because at that time, when the scriptural people were writing, the author Child sacrifice was a thing. God's saying, we don't do that. And not only that, but take that ram and sacrifice that ram instead. And that ram had its uh, horns in a thicket, in a, in a bush. And so there's this powerful image of God providing the sacrifice. We'll get to that later when we get on to the New Testament, why that's significant. Um, so we have more patriarchs. Abraham's son Isaac has a son named Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons, and his name is changed from Jacob to Israel. And Israel becomes the name that we call the people of Israel. And then Israel, his 12 sons, become the 12 tribes of Israel. And so when we see maps and we see all these different names for all these different peoples and in the Middle East and different times, it, you're more likely seeing the different names of the different tribes, which are named after the sons of Jacob. Eventually, Joseph is born, one of the youngest sons of, I think the youngest or one of the youngest, I don't remember which, to be honest, uh, is the youngest, Joseph is the youngest son, I believe, of Jacob, or second youngest, Benjamin's the youngest. So, um, so second youngest son, uh, his brothers get We've seen Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat, probably or heard of the story, uh, and gets, you know, uh, brothers get jealous, and whether or not that movie is completely accurate, I don't know. I've only seen it once a long time ago. But, but the story, generally, we know. He goes, brothers are jealous, throw him down a well, um, and then he gets taken by travelers to Egypt, and then eventually in Egypt, he um, is, eventually gets up to the second in command in Egypt, his family comes down during a famine. We need food. We need food. They don't recognize him. Eventually, they recognize him, and they find out that he's second in command. Everybody's fine. Everybody's happy. We have food. We're going to stay in Egypt. But then the next time period starts, and it's not a good time period because it's 400 years of slavery because the next king after, the next pharaoh after, was not uh, did not know uh, this family, this, this tribes, these tribes, these, what would be the 12 tribes of Israel. So he enslaves them out of fear that they would take over his land. And so God is faithful to his promise to Abraham. He's faithful to giving him descendants, and he keeps his covenant. 
That's the threefold covenant, land, nation, royal dynasty, and worldwide blessing. And that's how those are fulfilled. And we will see that in a moment, what that looks like. So Egypt and Exodus. So this one is red after the Red Sea. Some think that it wasn't actually called the Red Sea, but the Reed Sea, R-E-E-D. Uh, but for our purposes, we're just going to remember red because the Red Sea. Um, so in the Exodus, we have the, the, uh, the family is becoming bigger and bigger. And now we have one holy nation that God is, um, is loving. And the key figures are Moses and Aaron and many others um, in this book. The book is Exodus. And this p- time period is roughly, roughly 1800 to 1446. Um, And we have here the image of uh, Moses with the burning bush and Moses uh, parting the Red Sea. And so so Moses gets, uh, so Moses is born after about 400 years of slavery uh, in Egypt. He is born to um, an Israelite woman and the Pharaoh at the time wanted to kill all the young men two years and under or something like that. He wanted to kill all the young men. Um, And so she floats him down the river in kind of like a mini ark, if you will, um, and floats down the river to Pharaoh's daughter. He's a part of Pharaoh's family instead, kind of taken in, and he's raised up there. But that doesn't last forever because he sees one of his people, his Hebrew Israelite people, being mistreated by a taskmaster. And he ends up deciding that he wants to defend this guy and so he kills the Egyptian taskmaster and um, he is chased down out into the desert. In the desert, he sees God in the burning bush. He encounters God speaking to him through the burning bush. And God gives him a name. He says, I am who I am, which basically means I am existence itself. You can't control me. You can't grasp me. I am beyond your wildest imagination. And so he meets God and God says, I want to let, set my people free. And so God sends 10 plagues on Egypt because Pharaoh is, heart, is hardened. And eventually after those 10 plagues, the people are set free from Egypt. And then, um, but the last thing that they do is they keep a Passover meal during the last plague. So in order that they might be saved from this last plague, the 10th plague, was the death of the firstborn. And so rather than um, allowing God's own people to die in this plague, God asked them to put the blood, sacrifice a lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, uh, and that when the angel of death passes over, he will pass over their house rather um, rather than take the life of the firstborn. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. And Pharaoh ends up uh, giving in, but not completely because they chase after the Israelites in the desert. And then the Red Sea uh, is opened up miraculously for the people of God. Uh, And then they pass through and then the sea crashes in on the Egyptians after they uh, try to pursue them. Um, Later on in this time, uh, Moses and the people gather at Mount Sinai. And one of the most important things in my scripture studies over the years that I've learned is the importance of the law to the Israelite people, to the Jewish people. The law, the law, the law. Uh, So they receive the, the, the Ten Commandments as Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. And um, God gives gives those to him on the on um, the tablets. Um, And so uh, that is a huge, huge piece. The first three commandments mean focusing on love of God, the last seven focusing on love of neighbor. Um, And so the uh, next section here is the people um, also uh, end up committing idolatry. God saves them and not so long after they got used to the gods that they had in Egypt, the lowercase g gods in Egypt. And so they, they thought, well, Moses is up there on the mountain for a long time. I don't know what to do. Should, what do we do? And so then Aaron, who should be a good priest and tell people, no, we only worship one God. And, and people approach him and he says, well, okay, just give, me, just give me your jewelry or something. We'll make something happen. And then they, 
end up making a golden calf, worshiping the golden calf, and following those gods that they should have been letting go of. But after 400 years in the Egyptian culture, idolatry uh, was, was very, very firmly rooted in their hearts. So God has the, um, comes down, Moses comes down and then God has Moses uh, burn the, the calf and put it in the river and have the people drink the flakes of gold or whatever it is that they, um, that they had made that with um, to remind them this isn't right. You shouldn't do that. Um, so anyway, then Moses builds a tabernacle for God, a dwelling place for God. And that's that stage here. The next stage is the desert wanderings. Um, this is the tan color for the desert. And here we see the image of uh, Moses putting the bronze serpent on the um, wooden plank here. So um, the main people here are Moses and the people of Israel. The books that we're looking at are Numbers and Deuteronomy, time period 1446, 1406. The key themes are disobedience, purification, and testing. So, um, so the, the, the general gist of the desert wanderings is that people complain against God. We're thirsty. We're hungry. Why did you let us out here? We wish we would have just been able to eat the food in Egypt. We wish we would be slaves again. Why didn't you let us out here? We don't like Moses. Moses is a bad leader. And it's just complaining, complaining, complaining. Then God says, stop doing that. And he reprimands them for that. And it's just this constant cycle. But one of the powerful uh, realities that Jesus will talk about in John's gospel is this reality of the bronze serpent. So they complain against God. I think it was with uh, not having food or water or something. So God sends seraph serpents to bite them, to reprimand them. And, uh, or he allows this evil to happen so that they repent. Because any time that God does anything that we perceive as um, harsh in the Old Testament is only so that they might be healed. Just like a good parent um, shows discipline to their children in the proper way, um, so that their child is healed from whatever disordered behavior they're in. So God only acts in, in love and only acts to heal. There's this idea of an Old Testament God, a God who's different from the one in the New Testament. It's the same God, but sometimes it looks a lot different because the people are so far away from communion with God that he has to work with them step by step by step. And you discipline a child at the age of two much differently than one who's 15 or 16. And so these people are at age three and they don't know God and he has to work with them at the age of three. And so if you see that happening in the Old Testament, that's the best way that I can think of it myself. So this bronze serpent, God tells Moses to put it on a pole to have the people look at the bronze serpent, the same thing that is killing them, that if they look on it, they'll be healed, they'll be saved. And so they do. And so we'll hear more about that when we get to the New Testament. The next period is conquest and judges. So this is green. God promised them land. God promised them the land. But rather than getting into the land, they spent 40 years in the desert because they spent 40 days spying out the land that God had promised them in the desert. And they said, no, 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 we can't do this. They're too big and too strong in that land. We can't take them. And so God's like, okay, your lack of faith, stay, stay in this desert for 40 years longer, and then I'll let you cross over. Finally, that 40 years is up. And they get to the green hills of Canaan, uh, which is the land that God promised. So the main figures here are Joshua and the judges of Israel. The books are Joshua, Judges, uh, 1 Samuel. This is a time period, about 400 years. And the key themes, God fulfills his promise. He gives them a land. He gives them the land. Um, and the other piece of this is the cycle of sin. So we have Moses is the, the head honcho of the Israelites for many years. And then he passes on the reins um, to Joshua. And Joshua is a very good leader as well. Although Moses was imperfect. I skipped over some details, but Moses was imperfect, um, just like all of us. And so they get into the land and they take Jericho by circling around Jericho, seven days of processions around Jericho. And then finally God takes it for them. Um, and then what happens is they get into the land and I think this is true for us too, when, and I know myself, when I get really comfortable in life 
and I don't have any adversity, I don't have any challenges, I get really comfortable and I start to act out of, of who I should be. And that's kind of, I think, what could have happened with the Israelites, that they got the land, they got everything they wanted. So what else is there to do? We don't need God. We have everything we need. And so the cycle of sin starts in the book of Judges especially. So um, these judges are not judges as we think about judges. They're more warriors that defend Israel against their enemies who are surrounding them. And so this cycle of sin starts. You have, um, you start, the people of God in this time, the Israelites, they sin and they get into servitude and other nations take them over. And then they do supplication. They ask for God's help. God, please help us. We're, we're overtaken by this other nation. God saves them. And then they forget what God did for them. And then the cycle continues again and again and again. And God sends them different judges to save them. And then the judges themselves continually get progressively less morally upright <laughs> over the time. And we know Samson to be one of those. And Samson um, was not a very morally upright judge, but he did take out a lot of Philistines. So at least, you know, he, en he ended his life, I guess, defending Israel. But so that's that. Next we have the royal kingdom. Purple for royalty is the, is the purple. The key figures here are King Saul, King David, King Solomon. Now we don't just have a holy nation, we have a holy kingdom. So it's expanding beyond just the borders of what they had before. Um, and the books are First and Second Samuel there. Uh, time period is not that long. So this is a good period, uh, at least for unity. Uh, and it doesn't last very long because we're, I guess we're just not capable of <laughs> sustaining it in the Old Testament here. So key themes are kingship and temple. So um, uh, the people say, we want a king like all the other nations. And we don't want God as our king. We want a king like every, all the other nations so that we don't get overtaken over and over again by these other nations. We want somebody to fight for us because kings at that time were warriors. They fought. Um, they're very much into that. And so God says, all right, whatever. We'll let you have your way, even though I know it's not right, but you're, you're, you don't get it, so whatever. So God gives them a king and King Saul. King Saul is that first king. And not a very good king, and he ends up um, becoming very jealous of the up-and-coming king, or the up-and-coming David, who, goes, who comes on the scene. And because Saul begins to worship other gods, because Saul begins to, um, to sin against God and, and against what it means to be a king, God raises up David, and David and Goliath, the classic story, David takes the sling and takes out Goliath, and then his fame as a warrior begins to grow. And so people say, David has killed his, Saul has killed his thousands and David has ten thousands or something like that. So Saul gets really uh, um, insecure about that and ends up trying to kill David for many chapters in these books. But then Saul ends up dying himself. Um, so then David is this very significant figure in, um, in the Bible. And so he becomes a king and um, he is another imperfect character, commits adultery, tries to cover up that adultery, kills a guy or has a guy killed. Um, and so sin begins to proliferate after that. But God made a promise to David that is very significant. In 2 Samuel 7, he said that I will, David says, I want to build a house for you, God. You're living in a tent. I want to build a nice house for you. And God says, no, you're not going to build me a house. Your son's going to build me a house. And not only that, I'm going to build you a house. And that term house is not just the physical structure, but a dynasty, a dynasty that will not pass away. He said, I'm going I'm to put somebody on the throne. I'm going to put somebody from your descendants that will be king and his kingdom will last forever. And this promise is what the Israelite people have to hold on to because there's a lot of stuff that's about to happen that's going to question if God is going to be faithful to that promise because the people aren't faithful to God, but he, he made that unconditional promise. That he would do this no matter what. And so God makes that covenant to David. And um, so we move on and David's um, sons and other people begin to fight over the throne. David eventually dies. His son Solomon takes over. And um, Solomon is, has great wisdom, but he, and God gave him that, but he doesn't use it for the good 
So he becomes a corrupt king. Um, he, uh, kings were said, don't have, a, in Deuteronomy, God said, don't, kings don't have a lot of horses, um, don't um, have a lot of wives, um, and don't have a lot of wealth. And he violates those three in spades. He has thousands of horses, 700 wives, 300 concubines. I don't even know how that happens. Um, <laughs> six, 666 talents of gold annually. So what Saul is doing <laughs> is he is taxing his own people, basically making them work as slaves to build the projects that he wants to build to make money for him so that he looks good. And while all of this is happening, people are getting bitter, like, a, like, a, like a boss that makes you work really hard but doesn't appreciate anything that you do. Um, that's what, that was Solomon, what was, was what he was doing. So then the people in the, in the north, um, he's in the southern part of the Holy Land, and the people in the north are starting to get pretty upset about this because they don't feel like he's a very good king and he doesn't appreciate them. And so um, what happens is um, his son begins to take over, and we get into this next time period. This is black, the divided kingdom, because it's the darkest period in Israel's history. So, um, so we see the key figures are the kings of Israel the, uh, and, and the kings of Judah, Elijah, Elisha the prophets, Isaiah the prophet, and the kings of Assyria. So this is where the Bible salvation history stuff can get a little hazy for people. So um, it's really, but it's a really important section. So I'll try to explain it as, simp like as clearly as possible and we'll, we'll talk through it. So what happens is Solomon, um, he dies, his son, uh, Rehoboam takes over and then the people say, Rehoboam, will you be more merciful than your father was? Will you kind of, you know, lat loosen up a little bit? And he says, and he says, um, some people who are some wise elders in the community said, no, don't be unmerciful like your father. Be merciful as, your, as you should be to your people. And then he's like, okay, I won't listen to you. I want to talk to my, to my young friends here. What do you guys think I should say to these people? And they say, you know, no, you should, you should be even more harsh. You should make even more money. And so I, I, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, like, if, if my father would whip you with cords, I'm going to whip you with scorpions. That's how he responds to the people in the north. So he's like very not wise, very uh, not loving, and... So then the kingdom that used to be united is now divided. The people in the north say, go to your tents, O Israel. Go to your tents, Israel. And so they separate. And then a guy with a similar name named Jeroboam is their king. So we got Rehoboam in the south at this kingdom. And we got Jeroboam who takes this. So these are the Benjamin and Judah are these southern two tribes that um, that Rehoboam is still in charge of. And then we have the northern ten tribes are the people that, um, that Jeroboam is now in charge of. And the temple, the most significant place in the whole Holy Land, in the people where God lives, that Solomon built. I forgot to mention that. That's very significant. Solomon built this temple in Jerusalem. That's where God's presence dwells. That's where God wants to be worshipped. At that time, that's where the temple is. And so what Jeroboam does, very, very uh, politically smart, but faithfully, religiously, morally, very bad. He says, we're going to start building our own temples. We're going to start making our own priesthood. We're going to start making our own liturgical church, if you will, calendar. We're going to make all the stuff that we want so that you guys don't have allegiance to the south. We're going to do what we want to do so that we have power so that this guy doesn't oppress us anymore. Understandable, you don't want to be oppressed. But did he go about it the right way? I don't know. Um, so we have um, the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. So when you hear the word Israel after this time period, it's referring to the northern ten tribes. When you hear the word Israel before this time period, it's referring to all twelve tribes. When you hear the word Judah, it's referring to the southern tribes. So Benjamin, Judah, and the Levites in the south, and everyone else in the north. 
So there, what, what happens is very simple, but a lot of details that I'm going to leave out is that there's kings in the north, there's kings in the south. And the kings in the north, um, there's a great deal of, um, there's, about, there's a lot of different dynasties, there's a lot of different families. Uh, they kill each other, there's infighting. There's, uh, the Bible records zero good kings from the north, the people who left. Uh, and the south, there's mostly one family, I, I believe the whole time uh, uh, for this time period. Uh, mostly one family, I, I'd have to double check that. But, um, and they're a little better. There's like two or three uh, good kings in the south out of the, the many that they have. Um, and so the sin, the idolatry, the, um, the worship of false gods, child sacrifice, um, cult prostitution, all of these things are running rampant in, um, in the north and sometimes in the south. Very, very tumultuous time in Israel's history. So what happens is God says, I want to heal you, so I'm going to send you prophets. I'm going to send you prophets so that you will turn from your evil ways so that they can tell you what I want to tell you. So Eli people like Elijah, who is considered one of the greatest prophets, um, uh, prophesies to uh, the kings, I believe in the north, but I'd have to double check that. Um, and he defeats the prophets of these false gods. He does a lot of miracles, like raising a young man from the dead. Um, and he actually is taken up in the, the clouds when he died, when he, when he, at the end of his earthly life. So he's one of only, I think, three people, three or four people in the Bible that is raised up in, in, uh, in a chariots of fire. Uh, and uh, so really, really interesting story. And then Elisha is another prophet that follows after him. So that's that time period. Very significant for understanding scripture and the story. So then we get into this exile. So the, the, it's baby, Jeff Caven says baby blue because they're in, uh, they're singing the blues, like they're sad in Babylon, B-A-B-Y-L-O-N. So baby, B-A-B-Y-L-O-N, Babylon. So baby blue, Babylon. So that's where they, the Southern people get exiled to eventually. So this time period, the biggest dates I've taken in scripture classes and like, get hammered home every time is 722. 722 is when the north um, was, what the northern 10 tribes um, were exiled by the Assyrian Empire. And um, five, uh, this, uh, this, the date's not here, but 586, 587 is when the southern two tribes were um, exiled from where they lived to Babylon. So how that happened is this. So basically what happens here is, oh, there's 587, I have it down there. Um, the, the world powers start to get really strong in this time period. And for the next 700 plus years, the people of God are going to be greatly affected by the world powers. So the first world power that arises, that takes, them, that takes the northern tribes um, out is the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire, it looks like that. So this is, um, this is, the, this is the area that we were just looking at. And so they, um, they, they, they take everything. They, they were very violent. They were very unmerciful. And they were just power hungry. The ancient world was a cruel place. And if you wanted something, you had to kill people to get it. Uh, as that, at least that's what they thought. And so there was, the world powers were not merciful. They were a lot like Vikings, if, if you want to think of like a, an analogy maybe that we can connect with. They, they were cruel and they were willing to take anybody out to have more power. So the Northern Ten, the northern ten tribes, um, they tried to revolt against Assyria when they were made a vassal state. And so Assyria says, nah. And so they just crush them. Um, and then they actually deport them to different places. And then they send in other, other countries and other peoples into the northern tribes to make kind of um, a mixed race and a mixed religion, which in our time doesn't seem like a big deal. But in that time, like the purity of your religion and the purity of your marriages, and that's, that's how you kept your people together. That's how you kept your faith. And there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
Um, but here, the people begin to intermarry in the north with other people. And so that's what we call our modern, in the time of Jesus, the Samaritans. Because the, the, the capital of Samaria in the north, people began to intermarry and then they were called Samaritans. So their, their identity was called into question of whether or not they were actually Jews. Um, so the purpose of the exile is to bring the people back to repentance and back to the fullness of life that God wanted for them. The, the only reason God allowed the exiles was so that they would turn back to him. So you have prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet prophesying to say, turn away from your idolatry, turn away from your evil ways and come back to me. Um, that song, come back to me with all your heart, don't let fear, that, I'm pretty sure that's from Hosea. I could be wrong. I think that song is called Hosea, um, who's one of the prophets of that time. So that's the basic gist. Repent, come back, because you're not going to find fulfillment where you're at. So in the south, um, the, the, uh, there's, some, there's a lot of really bad kings, but there's some really good ones. Hezekiah being one, and Hezekiah comes around in 715, and he removes the idolatry from the south. He attempts to free the people from Assyrian domination. So the Assyrians try to take over the southern tribes too, but because God was with them and because their king was faithful, uh, the, the report in the scriptures is that an angel of the Lord went to the army of the Assyrians and killed over, I think it was over 100,000, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, and then they fleed and ran away. So God protected them they, and their faithfulness. But then the wickedness returns. Uh, his son Manasseh um, commits some of the worst sins of idolatry and child sacrifice. Um, but then I think it's either his son or his grandson Josiah is another good king in the year 640. And he has major reforms sought to, to bring people out of that idolatry. But he dies in battle. And then the next world power comes along, the Babylonians. And they have a similar thing. They, they start to, to beat the Assyrians. And now the Babylonians are the ones that are in charge. And over the course of two or three different waves, two or three different sieges, uh, two or three different times of deportation of the southern tribes, they finally overtake it and f destroy the people um, in, in, in a lot of the parts of the city and the temple, which was the most sacred place, the most important place of all. So the people on the south are now in Babylon for the most part. Not all of them, but most of them are in Babylon. So they have to find a way to practice their faith in exile. So then the prophets offer hope, though, in the midst of this time. So Isaiah and other prophets speak about a king who will come who is divine, who will reign forever, who has the spirit of the Lord, who will bring a message of justice to the poor, a renewal of creation. And so it's not hopeless because God has plans. So then they return. King Cyrus, um, I think the yellow is brighter times ahead. Um, so they return. King Cyrus of Persia takes over. He's the next world power, the, the next world power. And they begin to rebuild um, the, the city of Jerusalem. They come back gradually from exile. And the people begin to, um, the southern kingdom returns. So this is the south. And they um, rebuild the walls. Uh, they they uh, try to rebuild the temple. Although the people who had seen the old temple cried at how it was not even close to what it, what it was before. When they finally finished it, they're like, really? We spent all this work and it just looks like half as good. Um, and they also tried to really bring back for very, very strongly the law. Um, so um, to, to really reinforce that law that God had given them that they needed to be faithful to. And so that time period is, um, is very good. Then the Maccabean Revolt, year 167 to 81. So the next world power is the Greeks. And the Greeks come along and the people are in their area. And these are the books, 1st, 2nd Maccabees. So Alexander the Great and others, um, he takes over. And then a few kings later, or maybe the next one, King uh, Antiochus IV is called, often called Antiochus Epiphanes. So he takes over and he really does not want the Jewish people, the, the people of God, to practice their faith. He wants to be completely in control. And so he starts to do things like try to make Greek culture the, the culture. And, he, and so there's a lot of different things that he does. He begins to persecute anybody who starts to, 
to practice like circumcision was a law that I actually haven't talked about, but a huge part of the Jewish identity for the males, especially of course, was, this, was circumcision. And, and he, he wanted people to, to not do that, uh, to make that illegal. Um, and so um, he was very, very harsh. Um, and there's a severe per persecution and he began to, um, to start to kill people, to martyr them, who, anyone who resisted. But there was actually uh, a, um, a uh, kind of a fight, fighting back, if you will. Uh, there's a priest named Mattathias and his sons called the Maccabees who made an armed resistance against the Greeks. And they actually defeated them against all odds um, for, a few, for a good number of years uh, at one, year 167 and 164. And they reclaimed the land and established Jewish independence. And they celebrated a feast to commemorate the victory called Hanukkah. So if you've heard of Hanukkah, that's where Hanukkah comes from. Um, and they, it's a feast of rededication um, of, of the temple. Uh, and then there's a dynasty called the Hasmonean dynasty. And they rule for 100 years. But... They're not of that Davidic line. So God said, I will take somebody from your descendants. And they say, and they take over. And it's not one of David's descendants. Their leadership becomes very corrupt and more and more influenced by the Greeks. And um, then the next world power comes along, the Romans. And the Roman general Pompey takes control of the Holy Land and Palestine. And here we come to the time of messianic fulfillment. So, um, we have the gold uh, here um, for the, the gifts of the Magi is, what he, is what he, uh, why he has that. So, this, this, um, this family, this couple, this nation, this kingdom becomes a one holy Catholic and apostolic church, spanning the entire world, open to all people um, who, uh, who love the Lord and want to follow him. And so, obviously, this year, <laughs> around year zero, there's debates about the exact year of Jesus' birth, but around year zero um, to about the year 33 AD. So Christ comes. We obviously have seen a lot of sin, a lot of brokenness, a lot of division, a lot of attempts by God to send his prophets to send different th people to heal what has been broken in the relationship that they have with God. So God, um, God says, I need to do something definitive. I need to do something absolute so that people will know my love for them, that they will come to me, and that they will have, be in relationship with me. And so God decides to take on our flesh, to walk our walk, talk our talk, and die our death, and rise to new life so that we can have new life with him. And so this is, um, we're much more, this is a period that we're very familiar with, right? Jesus um, being born. Um, uh, after the angel uh, announces, the angel Gabriel announces that Christ will be born to Mary, she says yes. And so then he grows, has his public ministry. Um, and at the beginning of that, there's the, uh, his baptism, which I think is a, a beautiful um, reality because as we see looking back now, um, Noah and the ark, um, the, the water of uh, that time was a cleanse, supposed to be a cleansing water. Um, and the wood, some see, is the wood of the cross that heals us from sin of the ark. And so we see that Jesus wants to remind us that, okay, this baptism thing, we should all do that. And so he sanctifies those waters for us. And God says, this is my beloved son. Goes into the wilderness. We looking back, we see in the wilderness, he takes on, and he embodies the people of Israel. He becomes like them. And he walks in the desert for 40 days as they walked in the desert for 40 years. And he, rather than being disobedient and complaining against God, was faithful to God. Um, we see that Jesus establishes um, his church on the rock of St. Peter, um, the first pope. Um, we have the feast day of St. Peter and Paul today. And so Jesus gives him the keys to the kingdom of heaven, puts him in charge um, and um, Ever since 260 popes later, we still have that same, uh, that same Holy Father, uh, that same office, if you will, um, that is given to us to shepherd, to, to guide us to, to truth under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so Jesus establishes the kingdom of God, preaches the kingdom of God, does healings, miracles. We all know that. And then in Holy Week, we see so many beautiful parallels to these time periods before 
um, where um, Jesus says this temple will be destroyed and in three days I will raise it up. But he's speaking of the temple of his body. So the temple had God's presence before, but now Jesus is saying, you don't need the temple anymore because my body is the temple. My body, I am God incarnate. Um, another beautiful connection is the Last Supper that we see is a, a, a recapitulation, if you will, or a, a, a representation of Passover. They're celebrating a Passover meal like they did in Exodus. And Jesus changes those words of that ritual saying, this is my body, which will be given up for you. And we see hours later when he dies on the cross, his blood is sprinkled on the, on the wood of the cross, just like the blood was sprinkled on the wood of the doorposts um, and the people. And that wood, that blood that comes forth from Christ saves us from sin, just as it saved the children from uh, the angel of death. We see um, in um, so many different connections uh, but Jesus claims to be God, and he vindicates that claim by rising from the dead. Um, and so that is very powerful. There's so many more connections I could make, but I want to try to give you a little time for questions. <laughs> so church, uh, white, the spotless bride of Christ, um, is what, is what uh, God wants for us. So here we have Mary, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. James, St. John, I didn't finish that. Um, so um, here we have the Acts of the Apostles, so the early church. And the beautiful thing about the Acts of the Apostles is we see that individually in the lives of the apostles and also in the people collectively, that as they are baptized into Christ, that they are made other Christ, that they begin to live like Christ. They begin to preach as Jesus preached about the kingdom. They begin to work miracles as Jesus worked miracles. They begin to... Um, to say, just like St. Stephen, when he died as a martyr, he was opposed by the Jewish people, by the, the, the Jewish leaders at that time. And he, um, he, uh, he spoke against them. And then he was persecuted. And as he died, he said very similar words to Jesus, forgive them. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And so the Acts of the Apostles is written very specifically to show that who we are meant to be as Christians, we're meant to be other Christ, that to live the life of Christ, this, his life, his death, his passion, his resurrection, that when we get baptized, we live that reality every day. Even if we're not dying that day, even if we're not being resurrected that day, it's a reality that we live every single day by virtue of our baptism. Um, and so they go out and preach to the nations and they receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which empowers them to do God's work. Um, and so then they spread out and eventually, you know, people are dying for the faith but it's the gospel spreads because, uh, as they say, we cannot speak, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Um, and so the people um, continue to die for the faith. Um, and so here we are today. Uh, the same God who chose Abraham, who um, worked all these wonders and signs to the prophets and, and through, uh, through his son is still with us today in the Holy Spirit is still with us today in the Eucharist, is still with us today in, uh, in the office of the papacy and the bishops and priests. And so now it's our turn to continue that story, to draw people more into this loving relationship with God who saves us, because clearly we have a problem. The problem is sin and separation from God, and we see that very vividly in the Bible. And we know there's a problem, and it has to be addressed by Jesus saving us from that.